we're now in module two and we're gonna focus on decision trees. Um, so we've got about an hour and a half or maybe an hour and 20 minutes here. Um, we'll cover this one. It's a mixture of both a lecture and a lab. Uh, and the way that we'll do a lot of these things is we're not just gonna have labs alone. We're always gonna have a bit of a lecture and then we'll allocate about 15 or 20 minutes for people to do the lab. Um, we're not gonna make you code. Otherwise, I think we would be sitting and watching all day as people are trying to figure out how to code. Um, so a lot of the code has been given to you. And so what you're gonna be doing is mostly running programs or playing around or looking at things just to sort of get a feel for what's there. I'll explain that later on. So this is a combined lecture module on, on decision trees. Um, so we've seen a picture like this before, uh, and we're talking about classification in machine learning. So we might have labeled data. Here's the red group and the blue group. Uh, I could call them Republicans and Democrats if you want. And we've done a machine classifier that now has separated them. Um, and now we can see how they distinct they are. Um, so, you know, machine learning or any classification algorithm and that includes things like logistic regression, principal component analysis, partially squares discriminant, SVMs, neural nets, hidden Markov models, all those things can do classification. And they can take this, you know, labeled data, which list initially looks really confusing, and it'll pull them apart and separate them. So Today, we're going to, at least for this module, look about you know, what is classification, what is clustering. We're going to talk about decision trees, which are a form of machine learning. And we're going to talk about um, how you can convert a decision tree into something that's a little more mathematical using information gain, Shannon entropy, and the Gini index. We're going to talk about feature selection. And we're going to show how you can use this to do classification for flowers, which is a toy problem that introdu introduces a lot of people to decision trees, and it's actually a really nice one. We're going to go through the Python code for a decision tree to separate irises, which are the flowers we're looking at. And then you guys will be able to use the CoLab for your first bit, and we'll see how you guys do with actually running those um, programs that we're going to provide to you. So diving right in, clustering is something that's different than classification. They are not the same. A lot of people think they are, but they're different. So clustering is a way of, of grouping objects that are logically similar. So clustering is like matching socks uh, after you've washed and dried them and they're all separated and now you have to match pairs of socks. Um, now, typically, the object classes haven't been defined or labeled and, and to do your, you know, um, sock clustering. If you were blind and you couldn't see the colors, you probably have to do it by their shape or size, hoping that, you know, all of them are sort of paired up to similar size and you can tell. Uh, if you had, you know, vision and you could see color or um, then you could start matching the socks by color, but you probably might have to match by size. But you, you have to figure that out yourself. Um, you might use some parameter to help with that clustering. You could do the same thing with you know, clustering balls or clustering toys, clustering paintings. Classification is something where things are labeled objects and you're essentially clustering by the label. So we have the blue and the red objects, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, um, and they're categorized based on their properties. Um, so in supervised machining, which learning, which is the most common thing, we, we use algorithms to um, essentially perform that classification. And in some cases to help with uh, assigning class labels for new data. So here's a bunch of new individuals. We don't know what, what they are, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. We can run our machine learning classifier and say, oh, this person is a Democrat or this person is a Republican. So decision trees are um, the simplest thing to um, implement for machine learning. Uh, they're easy to understand. <laughs> they make sense. They produce a rational agreement. Um, you can use, use decision trees for classification, which is what they're primarily used for, but you can also use them for curve fitting or line fitting. 
um, which is regression. And that means you can use them for numeric data. In the machine learning approach to, to decision trees, the computer or the model learns to split and categorize, or in the case of regression, how to fit or regress the data based on decisions. So it might use a greater than or less than number. It might use a yes, no. And it evaluates the cost of those decisions, whether this is a good split or a bad split or a good decision or a bad decision. So the example of um, a decision tree was, you know, the Titanic sinking, what do we do? Women and children first. So we're looking at the data that was collected and we can learn from that, you know, how did they make their decisions? And we can see that most women survived the Titanic. And then those of the men who did survive, usually they were younger and they were usually parts of siblings um, or had spouses. And if you were single and male and old, you usually died in the Titanic sinking. And you can see that there are boxes with so things marked as, you know, gender, age, uh, survived, age cutoffs, decisions, and we have um, um, branches, which are the lines. Those are called edges. So that's this, this tree-like structure in a decision tree. So we've got uh, seven nodes and um, I think six edges. So a definition of decision tree is a, is a flow chart in which each internal node represents a test, an attribute. Um, so male, female, old, young, siblings, no siblings. And each branch um, or node represents the outcome of that test. Are you male? Are you female? Are you young? Are you old? Are you with a family or not? Um, and uh, there's a, a leaf node that represents the class label, young, old, male, female, sibling, no sibling. Um, and then the path from the root, which is at the top of the tree to each of the um, nodes is sort of the classification rules. So there are two types of decision trees, the classification tree, which is the classic one. It's for classific classification. Um, it can, be used once it's constructed, it can then predict or classify things. It could predict, you know, if there's another sinking of another boat uh, off of Newfoundland, what are you supposed to do? So the, you know, ship captain will call up his decision tree and say, okay, these are the people that should get on the boat, uh, the rescue boats, and those are the ones that have to sink. Uh, same sort of thing as, you know, are you Republican or, or Democrat? You might decision as, did you vote for Trump or did you not? And then how old are you and are you male or female and are you college educated or not? Those would be decision tree um, points to sort of decide whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. A regression tree is not for classification. It's, it's for handling or fitting numbers and it's, it's for curve fitting. Um, and um, you can use uh, decision trees for that as well. The official or formal name for a decision tree is a classification and regression tree or a CART because it can be used for both. Most people don't use uh, decision trees for regression. It's a shame uh, because it can be very useful. Um, so when you build up a decision tree, you have to decide which features, uh, which conditions to split the groups. Uh, and you also have to decide you know, when to stop. You know, if there are no more people left on the boat, um, then you, know, you don't need to keep on deciding who should get onto the rescue ship. Or if you've you know, got your collection of people when deciding when we're Republican or Democrat and there's no one left, then you can stop. Um, so in this decision tree, we had to say, you know, is, are you male or female? Yes, no. Are you greater than nine and a half? Or are you less than nine and a half? Do you have siblings and spouses? Yes or no? Those are the questions that are asked. Um, so what's marked in black is the decision or condition. Are you male, female? Are you young or old? Uh, there's a green, there's leaf nodes. And then this is sort of the result. If you were female, uh, you survived as a rule. If you were older than nine and a half, you generally died. And if you were male, if you had family, you also generally survived. And then the edges are the ones that connect the final result um, to each of those leaf nodes. So there are certain terms in decision trees. 
uh, the top node um, is the root node. That's the entire population. So if it's you know, all voters in the US, um, that's the, the root node. If it was all passengers on the Titanic, that's the root node. Um, and then eventually, if you're doing the classification, it's going to be divided into these different groups. So splitting is another term, and that means where we divide the node into two or more subnodes. So you can split into two, three, four, if you want. Uh, there's a decision node, um, and that's when that's when a subnode uh, splits into further subnodes. Uh, there's terminal nodes; those where you know the end is reached. So if you're a female, all women survived, or most of them did. Um, but then for males, there are lots of other decisions about whether you're young enough or old enough. Unrelated to um, the Titanic, we also call things uh, nodes, parent nodes, and child nodes not passengers in Titanic, but it's just the terminology in trees. Um, so uh, the root node is typically a parent node. Um, then later on, among the uh, male nodes, then we divided those into other groups. Um, so the male node also was a parent node that was then broken down into, are you young or old? Um, so decision trees are pretty easy to understand. Um, I think most everyone should have understood how we you know, did the Titanic um, separations, women and children first, um, and how decisions were made. And this is actually from real data uh, that they collected uh, after the Titanic sank and evaluated who survived. And, um, but um, so they, you, know, you can see what the decisions were made. It wasn't a black box. It wasn't a neural net. Um, so we call things white boxes which means that you, know, you, you can understand it. It makes sense. Um, decision trees and the examples I've been giving are mostly categorical, but you can do it for numbers. Uh, you don't have to do data transformation. You don't have to do data normalization. You don't have to do data scaling. It mim mimics or mirrors how humans think. And, and so we learn and a lot of the learning uh, and approaches that we have to life really do involve decisions and we make choices and we assess the costs of those choices. So in that regard, uh, decision trees have kind of a, a built-in feature selection. So you can kind of have all kinds of garbage data and it will do the feature selection on its own. And as I said, you just don't need to normalize or do any statistical fixes. Now decision trees are not the most robust machine learning method. Uh, a collection of decision trees, a random forest is pretty robust, but just a decision tree on its own is, is not as good as you know, uh, an LSTM or a GNN. Um, you can have small changes in the training data set and that can kind of screw up the whole uh, decision tree. There are tricks called bagging and boosting that work it. It's kind of a heuristic method. Um, we do use cost functions and evaluations called the Gini coefficients and entropy gain. Um, it, it can be prone to overfitting. Um, it's not going to give the best solution. And this is where random forests can fix that. Um, so again, these are sort of mathematically proven uh, because it's called a greedy algorithm. And there's a tendency to sort of keep on categorizing into some kinds of ridiculous categories. Um, so it, 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 it's not as maybe intuitive as we might like. So um, you know, we can kind of understand the Titanic model and decision tree approach there. Uh, the, the, someone told us the rule, women and children first. Um, but how do you learn a decision tree? Um, this is a little different. So um, the formal way of learning a decision tree is called recursive binary splitting, and it's also called iterative dichotomization. So I've taken a tree, so I turn it upside down, the roots in the, in the pot, and um, there's the root node, and then you can see the leaf nodes. So uh, recursive binary splitting is, you know, split two ways, um, and then you keep on doing it. So you start off with all the features and you start doing different splits and say, okay, should I just you know, split by age first versus male and female? 
should I split by, you know, their zodiac sign? Maybe that was how they actually decided he was going to be saved or not. Uh, and then you, you test and see, you know, how well did I do in predicting or determining how the Titanic survivors were selected. So the split with the lowest cost, that's one thing, or the highest information gain is the one that's selected. So from our decision tree, if you chose choose gender first, that's probably it was the most information. That's how they initially grouped people and said, okay, all women, this side. And then, um, okay, if you're a young kid, we'll also throw you in there too. Um, if we have, you know, three different features, it would be age, family size, gender, or sex, then there are potentially three candidate splits. So, okay, do we split by age first? Do we split by um, gender? Do we split by family size? Or do we split by zodiac sign? Those are things. And in each case, we calculate the cost of that split. Uh, and that could be the information gain, or entropy loss, or Shannon entropy, uh, or Gini index. Those are all things that calculate how that costs. So we repeat that calculation um, for other splits and for other regions uh, as we keep on cutting through this um, recursive binary splitting. Does that make sense for people? Assuming long silence is that you've all fallen asleep. Okay, um, information gain or IG is based on entropy, um, which is a sort of uh, something that if you don't know from physics is uncertainty or disorder. Um, and uh, the entropy is called Shannon entropy, which is something that was developed for information theory. Um, and the PI is the probability of being in a cost. Uh, and in a class. Um, so entropy is equal to the sum of these different probabilities of minus p log p. And you can calculate the in information gain for an entire data set, and you can calculate the information gain for a specific feature. Uh, or the, and so when you subtract the two from each other, you calculate the information gain for a specific feature. So is it age, gender, uh, number of siblings. So this information is given to, to which feature, which attribute, in Titanic case, it was age or gender or number or family size, uh, which is given the maximum amount about how to class or how to perform a class or split things. So in Shannon entropy, all the probabilities typically have to have a value that's one or less. Um, you have to have a negative sign because logs, things that are less than one will produce a negative number. Um, so if you have two classes, um, the likelihood of being in any one of them is you know, one half. So you can calculate the sum of the entropy for two classes is one half log two of one half, and you sum it over two states. So it's minus one half plus minus one half multiplied by a negative number, and that gives you a, an entropy of one. You can do the same calculation for four classes. This is now one quarter, where you do log two, one eighth, um, and you'll get maximum values depending on the classes of you know two, three, or four. So I'm going to take an example, and this one's not from the uh, Titanic, but this is one from uh, buying cars. And uh, we're talking about cars where there are old cars uh, and recent cars. There are low mileage cars and high mileage cars. And there are cars that have been road tested where this person has you know, driven them, not driven them. And there are recommendations that uh, are associated with this. Um, in these cases, if it's a recent car, low mileage and road tested, you should buy it. If it's a recent car, even with high mileage and it's been road tested, you should buy it. But if it's an old car and it hasn't been road tested and there's still low mileage, the recommendation is don't buy. And same way with a recent car, high mileage, but hasn't been road tested, don't buy. So these are, this is the table of data. And you're gonna try and then 
come up with a decision tree that would learn this so that if you came up with another example and said, okay, what if I have a um, an old car with a high mileage and has been road tested, you know, what should I do? Um, and this is, uh, you know, the training data that we build our, our decision tree with. So we have to start doing some math um, because we have to, in this case, calculate the Shannon entropy using that formula we saw before. And the first thing we're going to do is calculating calculate the entropy for the root node, which is buy or don't buy. And we take the number of cases that we're, we buy, it's two out of four, and the number of cases where we don't buy, that's two out of four. And so we can plug in the numbers uh, with the remembering that log of 0.5 is minus one and log of one is zero. And um, we can calculate that entropy uh, for the root node and it's, it's one. Um, now, from that root node, um, we're going to look at um, age of car. And we can see that there are three recent cars and there are, uh, there's one old car. And of those, you know, some of the recent cars we recommended buying, but one of them we didn't recommend and an old car we also said don't buy. So what we can do when we split this node based on age, we can calculate the entropy um, um, between, you know, using recent and using old uh, as the split decision or age, if you want. And we can calculate based on the number of instances. We can plug it into the log p. I've done those calculations at the bottom. And we can see that the, you know, recent entropy gives you some information knowledge, it's 0.98, 198, and the entropy for identifying old doesn't give us a whole lot of information. We can calculate the information gained by taking the ent entropy um, that's given from the parent node, um, which we have one, and then the, we can calculate the average of those two ch child nodes. So one had a, an entropy of zero, and the average, uh, the other one had a 0.918. We could do a, a one half, one half, but in this case we weight it because um, three of the instances out of the four was recent and one of the four was old, so we weight it a little differently. And so we take, uh, we get an average value of 0.688 in that group. And we can say the information gained to use age as a discriminator was one minus 0.688, which is 0.3. Not great but it's, it's, there's information there. Okay, so what if we tried mileage as our first choice uh, to split things? In this case, we've got information about low mileage and high mileage. And in this case, it was kind of random. Some cases it was low mileage we buy, in other cases low mileage we don't buy. So we can calculate based on the instances, we can calculate the entropy for each of them. So in the mileage case, the entropy for the low mileage was one, um, and the entropy for the high mileage was one, and the information gain from the weighted average of the children child node entropy is one. The information gain is one minus one, which is zero. So this information is completely useless. There's no information of, with mileage playing a role in our decisions. Okay, so this one won't be uh, a good child node. And then there's a road test. And you'll notice that in the cases of um, road testing, if we road tested, we would buy. And if we didn't road test, we wouldn't buy. So you can calculate the entropy for um, road testing. In this case, um, using that formula, we get a zero entropy for road testing and we get a zero entropy for not road testing. We calculate the weighted average of those, that's zero. Um, so the information gain from parent node, which is one, minus the child node is zero, we get an entropy gain or information gain of, of one. So this is perfect. Um, this one actually fully separates these things and is probably, well, should be our first choice as the decision tree. So 
I just wrote down the information gains for these things. Road testing got an information gain of one, mileage an information gain of zero, no information. And age tells us a little bit of information, but not as much as road testing. So the maximum information gain is for the feature road testing. So this would be the, well, not the necessarily the, well, we could just do the road note. And so this will be how we distinguish them. And do we road test? Yes, road test, no. And that's what we buy or don't buy. So information gain using Shannon entropy um, is um, formally correct. Um, but it involves calculating logs, and logs are expensive to calculate on a computer. So you can use something called the Gini index, which is used by um, actually economists to measure things like you know wealth disparity, but it's also used to measure um, um, variables being wrongly classified. So like Shannon entropy, it can range between zero and one. But it's um, the Gini index, which is a GI instead of information gain, which is IG. Uh, so it'll get a little confusing. But the GI is zero when everything belongs to a certain class, and one when things are random. So in this case, um, uh, information gain, IG, high information gain is good. Gini index, low index is good. And high index, high GI is bad. So it's similar. We use probabilities of, you know, just like the PI in the Gini or in the information gain or entropy method. Uh, it's not using logs, it's just P squareds. Um, so different people, different algorithms will use either information gain slash entropy or the Gini index. Um, both can be used. Um, highest information gain is good. Uh, lowest Gini index is good. Those are the ones that are placed at the root of the decision tree, and that's how you decide which ones are ranked, and then you rank things subsequently below that. So if you have one split and got information gain of 0.9 or a Gini index of 0.1, uh, that's the one that's you know the root node, and then you might get another one with a, an information gain of 0.4 or a Gini index of um, 0.3, so that might be your second one, and then you might have another node which has a, an information gain of, of 0.2 and a gene index of, of 0.8. That would be your third layer of your decision tree. It's a way of doing feature selection. Uh, it's a way of getting rid of things that are useless. So in the case of the car classification, it was the um, um, mileage, I think, um, was useless. Um, and this is, as I say, it's an automatic way of doing feature selection and essentially pruning the tree. These are just the mathematical functions about uh, the information gain, which is shown in green, or the Gini index. Um, there's something called the impurity index. So they, these are slightly different in terms of both their shape, um, but they're close enough. Uh, so both are totally valid. Now, when you're running machine learning algorithms, um, these have to also make sure that they're not producing trees that are too complicated. So this is called pruning, getting rid of branches that are of low importance. And pruning actually improves um, the decision tree performance. It is known to reduce overfitting. Obviously, it makes it less complicated. Um, and there's things called reduced error pruning and weakest link pruning. These are methods that are applied to decision trees to clean them up. Um, so you could also, in essence, what these are, just looking at all the calculated information gains. So if there are seven ways of getting information, and you evaluated all of them, you might just um, only include the high information gains, anything with an information gain of about 0.4 or a Gini index of below 0.3. In the case of um, the uh, Titanic one, there were just three features that they eventually decided on. They probably had other things that they could have chosen. Um, so um, the, the, the label was 
there's a passenger ID, that's kind of useless. Um, so that's not a useful feature. The survival was what you're trying to predict. And then the other features were, are you male? Zero is if you're not, uh, one is if you are, uh, your age and the size of the family. Um, so um, in terms of, um, you know, this is the, the actual data. There's 1,317 passengers on the Titanic. Uh, all of them were, um, had the information on age, male, female, and family size. Now, if you had data that was also on the zodiac sign that they were born on, um, there's 12 zodiac signs. I think that would be a useless feature and it would have no information and therefore no information gain. And so you could determine from your Shannon entropy that you know, zodiac had nothing to do, whereas age or male, female, in terms of the ranking, male, female had the highest utility, age was second and sip size was third. So our feature selection, this is what the Gini indices were, uh, or in terms of uh, information gain, they sort of one minus those. Um, so lowest Gini index, best uh, was sex, um, next best was age, last was sip size, but Zodiac had a Gini index of 0.98 or an information gain of pretty much zero. So this is, um, you know, how you're making your feature selections. It's how you're deciding what, where your nodes will be placed, which one's the first node, the second node, the third node. Um, you have to have a number of training inputs um, and identify the number of objects that are affected. So, you know, if you have a decision tree that splits, you know, three objects into three different um, categories, it's probably not a very useful thing. Um, um, sorry, Dr. Wishit, and I think Kenjil has her hand up. She wants to ask a question. Sure. Thanks. Maybe this is a, a silly question, but uh, I was wondering, um, suppose on the Titanic, if there were a lot more children, would the Gini index for the age have gone down? Um... Like if it became more important to classify the age before classifying the sex, just because there were so many more kids. Yeah, again, I think, I don't know if I can do the math in my head. I suspect um, if, you know, if you had a, a different population than what was currently in the, the Titanic yeah. uh, or what was known to be in the Titanic, then I think, yeah, I suspect the Gini index um, for, children would have gone down. But it, it, again, it's based on the historic data that you're- Yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand. I'm just trying to understand how, uh, yeah, that would factor into the model, but yeah, thanks. Um, so you, you decide the number of inputs you want to put in. Uh, you also have to decide on the maximum depth of your model. So is it going to be a three-layer decision tree, a four-layer, a 200-layer decision tree? Ideally, the depth of a tree should be small. Um, you know, two to three, maybe maximum four layers. There's no hard and fast rule, but you'll see most decision trees typically have a depth of three or four. Um, you can help and, and discern which, which depth you want to have by feature selection. So we're going to take a real example here. And uh, we're going to follow the workflow that I described last time. There's these six steps. And the six steps are define your problem, suggest a solution. Once you've described your problem, then you construct your data set. Once you construct your data set, then you have to do data transformation, or feature selection. Then you choose your model. Is it a decision tree, a neural net, or whatever? Then you test and validate your model. And then you say, OK, the model's ready you release it and say, you know, let's, let's use it. So in this case, it's how do I classify iris flowers in my area of the country based on the floral dimensions? So it's a well-defined description. It's a problem. Maybe it's not one that is 
earth shattering, but it is one that we have data for. So what we need to do is get some data to train and test. So this is a data set uh, that was introduced by um, Ronald Fisher. Um, Fisher has developed, he basically single-handedly developed all of statistics. Um, and he used it to, to use or describe linear discriminant analysis or LDA, something that I talked about before. And he took the data from three different flowers, purple flowers, iris setosa, virginica, and versicolor. And see, these are examples of these different flowers. Um, so they have essentially six petals, if you want. One is called the petal, and the other is called the sepal. And the sepal is generally longer um, and more fancy. Um, Versicolor um, has um, relatively uh, large petals and um, I guess moderately sized uh, sepals. Setosa has tiny petals and giant long um, sepals. Virginica, I think also the same. Um, this, the species can be differentiated by their petal and sepal dimensions. And um, this is showing length and width. So there's four dimensions, uh, two for petal size and two for sepal size. And um, this is how they classify those species. This data was actually collected by a Canadian, Edgar Anderson, and uh, it was published uh, in 1936. And it's showing actual measurements of the iris uh, setosa, versicolor, and virginica. And you can see that the sepal length for iris, uh, the versicolor, and virginica is generally long. Sepal width is about the same for the two of them, um, but the petal is quite distinct. Um, so the petal length is very long for virginica, moderately long for versicolor, and very short for setosa. Uh, the width is also um, kind of intermediate, so that they have tiny petal width for setosa, moderate petal width for versicolor, and fairly long, long width, wide width for uh, virginica. So that's highlighted here. Versicolor kind of sits in the intermediate. Virginica is the big one. Setosa is the small one. So you can kind of look at it yourself. Uh, you don't have to be a botanist or a machine learning expert. Kind of, kind of see a trend here. This is what's called a toy problem. Um, most machine learning ones, the data is too many, the separation is too complicated, too noisy. So this is why we can basically do in this machine learning example with just 150 examples, um, why we can do it. But because it's so trivial, you really don't need machine learning. Um, and this is, you know, when to use machine learning? Well, typically when the, the answer is, is not obvious or when the data set is so large that you just can't figure it out. So we're going to take the data set. In fact, we took the tables from the published paper and then entered all of them. So we have now uh, 150 rows, 50 of the setosa, 50 of the versicolor, 50 of the virginica, with all their sepal petal lengths and widths. So we've got the data. Now we can try and um, choose our model and we decided to do a decision tree. And so what we're supposed to do um, is uh, move to the Google Colab, uh, which you guys learned how to do, uh, and open a file there. Um, create a new notebook, which is where you're going to be typing your program. And then um, you can all start coding this. Now, uh, we don't have enough time for you guys to do the coding. Um, so uh, to save time, we've got you guys uh, with a Python code that's already been written. Uh, this was written a couple of years ago by um, uh, TAs who would develop this, help develop this course back in 2020. So uh, you can do this right now if you want. Uh, you can go to module two, which is what we're at. You can go to the Python code um, in the CBW Learning near Google Drive. 
if you don't want to do that right now, um, we can uh, save that for later. But um, this shows you how to navigate it. And, and I think I'd like people at least to try this. And I'll continue lecturing, but just you know, find your Python code. Don't choose the R code uh, and look at module two. And you're going to click on which is the Iris decision tree version four um, Python. And you're going to open it with the Google Code app. Now it's going to pop up some code, and it's going to be more than 100 lines of code. And the general ag algorithm for this decision tree is, is fairly simple. It's going to read your data. Uh, in this case, this is the 150 iris dimensions. You know, it's a table of four or five columns and um, 150 rows. You're going to check your data. And this is something you always have to do with machine learning because usually there's lots of data and you want to make sure it's clean. Then you're going to do a tr training and testing data split. You know, to you know, two thirds of it's going to be training, or seventy percent is going to be training, and thirty percent is going to be testing. Then you have to create your splitting function because this is how you're going to say, do I split them into you know three groups, two groups, one group? Um, how do I decide? Do I decide on petal length, on on sepal length? Um, and so I have to have a splitting function. And then I have to, I'm going to use the Gini index because it's faster to calculate than the, the entropy one. And so I'm going to put in a, a Gini index function to calculate things and decide, you know, how do I decide on petal length and sepal length and everything else. Um, and then I have to do a, a split function. So it's an optimal split function. So I decide based on the Gini index where to cut. I have to also have a, a terminal node function. So when do I stop? Because um, I've you know, finished everything. So I have to have a function that says, have, have I finished? And then I also have to um, sort of do a recursive splitting function. So these are all functions that I have to create to do this. Uh, they have names um, with underscores. And then once I've created all of these things to do that, I still have to have a way of calling it because by then if I've trained it, then I wanna be able to use it. So that if I have some more flowers with more dimensions, I can classify them and see how well I do. And that's actually what I'm gonna do with my testing set and say, okay, you know, I've trained and trained and trained. Um, how well does it do if I take some unseen data and does it classify things uh, into Setosa or Versicolor or Virginica properly? So with Python, um, you because we're going to do some math, uh, you have to import um, the NumPy uh, library. So this allows you to, to handle arrays or matrices. Um, and then pandas uh, to do what's called data frame um, framing or giving you some data framing capabilities. So these are almost always used in, in Python anytime you're doing. So we've imported. You're going to have code to import these two libraries or functions. We also have our code. This is the code for reading the data. So if you're looking at this, and I'm, I've just blown things up, um, but you've got this uh, function for reading, and it's in a data one CSV file. Um, and then we commented, called this is the data head, and then it's just giving the positions of where these data sets are. Um, so that's the reading. Um, this is the data verification, um, and we're just trying to see if um, we have to determine if there's any missing values. You know, we've got 600 different values. If we, what if we've only got 598? So it's looking through all of the data columns and uh, trying to find out if there's no data in them. And if there's, uh, if everything checks out, it'll print out, a, you know, data set is complete, no missing value. And this is always good to have for any machine learning algorithm because you, you can have, as I say, tens of thousands of data sets and just to make sure that it's clean. Now, if it's not clean or if there's a lot of data missing, um, we didn't put in a lot of fixes for it. And in fact, it's specific to each problem. Someone might have to impute it. If it was repeats, again, you might wanna to check to see if there are repeats. Um, 
if there's nonsensical values, you know, uh, if it was, you know, date of birth and date of death, and if the date of death is before the date of birth, that's something you should fix. Um, those are things that that happen or need to be done partly, you know, manually or with someone getting familiar with the data and say, you know, what's what makes sense here. In some cases, people will use imputing. Um, sometimes the value is you know, too low to measure, and so you'll give a, a lower estimate or an upper estimate. Um, some cases, you might have data that's um, you know, fairly consistent. Um, you know, you've got a child that's age five, it's a boy, but you're missing the weight. Um, you can probably use you know, the average weight for a five-year-old, and you're probably pretty good. Um, so that's a form of imputing. So effectively, we've done these first three steps. We've uh, defined our machine learning pro problem. We've constructed our data set. We didn't really have to select features because this is um, a decision tree. Uh, we've chosen uh, um, a recursive binary selection decision tree model. That's already done. And um, so if that's what we're going to do with every machine learning program, you have to divide your things into your training and testing set. So there's 150 flowers, 50 of each species, and we've decided to do a sort of a 70% um, for training and 30% for testing. Um, the, it's a holdout set. Technically, it's not threefold cross-validation because the cross-validation is typically done with the, um, with the 70. Um, but what we've done, and you can see how the code is written, there's green is the um, comments and uh, the function name is defined as def. And then we've talked about how we've divided it and we've multiplied you know, 0.7 by 150 and the length of the data set. And then we've got another one, which is the uh, testing data. So there's training data and there's the testing data. Um, so we've divided things into the testing and training. Then we have to call that genie index. That's the genie function. And this is um, where we're you know, actually doing the calculation of the genie index. Um, and we're trying to find the minimum genie. That's the, the good thing uh, in genie index. Remember, information gain, high information is a good thing. Genie index low. And um, if we're using petal length, we can come to, you know, choose different points. There's a two centimeter cutoff, a good one, a three centimeter cutoff, a good one, a four centimeter cutoff, a good one. And by calculating roughly every 0.1 centimeter interval all the way through, you can come up with a minimum genie index where you get a perfect separation between the setosas and both the virginica and versicolor. So at least you get one group perfect, and then you still have to classify versicolor and virginica separately. And that's the petal length. And the number is 2.4 or 2.5 centimeters. And you can plot the Gini index as you increment through 0.1 values, starting at one centimeter, 1 centimeter, 1.1, 1.2, 2.1, 2.4, 2.5, 3, all the way on plotting out your Gini index. And this is where you're going to do this for, you're going to look at sepal length, petal length, sepal width, petal width, and determine which one gives you your best Gini score. Um, and in this case, the minimum one, and which one gives you um, uh, the worst Gini score. Um, so before you calculate a Gini index over the different split points, you have to figure out how to split things. Um, and um, this is where we call this function that I talked about in the algorithm outline. It's called test split. And these are the lists that will contain the, the split. These are you know, a left split and a right split. These are two nodes, which we call the left node and right node. Um, and uh, we, based on that, you know, decide, OK, how many are going to be in the left node and how many are going to be in the right node? Um, so this is just a simple function, just to make sure that we've got these two groups partitioned. Um, they can be badly grouped groups or nicely grouped groups, but at least that separates these groups. 
then you now we can split things. We're going to calculate the, the, the Gini index. And so this is the Gini index function, Gini underscore index. And it's going to count all the samples at the split point. Uh, it's going to do a, a sum. Um, it's going to calculate the Gini index. Uh, and this is part one of it. So uh, we have these input classes because there's three different um, types of flowers. Um, we don't want to perform a Gini index on an empty group. Um, so that's a caveat that's put in the code. The second part, because this is a fairly long function, um, is where we actually calculate the Gini index. Um, summation is perform each of the class values. Um, and then we return this Gini calculation. And you can see the formula from the Gini calculation is in the earlier slides. And then this is just calculated here. Um, so it's the P squared summing over them. Um, now that's the end of the Gini function. Um, then there's the get split function. And this is determining optimal splits, split points, um, which uses both the test split function and the Gini index functions that we've previously written. Um, and we have to figure out you know, your minimum and maximum values to determine what, what was best, where did we get the split. In this case, the split um, was at 2.45 centimeters, uh, although this one only increments in 0.1 intervals, so it would be 2.4 centimeters. Uh, and as I said, this is this increment where we're stepping through this. So we're stepping by 0.1 instead of 0.05 centimeters. So this is going through this as we're determining the Setosa versus the Bursa color versus Virginica and looking at whether it's a petal length, petal width, sepal length, sepal width. And we're calculating the Gini index all the way through. And so this is what we're doing with these functions. We're stepwise moving through that. And you can see where the Gini index um, starts bottoming out and then it starts climbing. So determining those optimal splits um, through that 0.1 centimeter step. And then we have to decide um, when to stop growing the tree, when we've reached the maximum depth. Um, so it's the number of nodes uh, from the root node. And uh, this is the two terminal uh, function. Uh, and it has to be able to accommodate a few things. Uh, when the tree stops growing, when the final class is there, and that uh, the things, if they're not split perfectly, um, we have to choose a, a common class value. And then um, there's the recursive splitting function, which we talked about. That was another function that was described in the algorithm. So we have to write this one. Um, and um, here's the, you know, the split function or get split. We get the left and right ones um, and we process and repeat, process and repeat. Um, and then we determine or use a minimum size to force a terminal load if there's too few samples. So if we split and there's nothing left, um, that's a terminal node. Uh, the, def, the split function has um, you know, certain components into it. Um, if, we, if we reached an empty group, we see if this is a terminal node. If our maximum depth has already been reached, then we have to force terminal nodes and stop doing the splitting. If we still haven't reached the maximum depth, we can still force to do more splitting. Um, and so split and get split, get call as needed. Start up, there is a question from Lance, I guess, uh, specifically. Do the slides correspond with the Iris TT4 Python code? Some of the functions in the slides are not in, in this notebook. They should, uh, I think, I mean. Just checking. Yeah. You guys should check, because that was supposed to be done for the check. So it's there. Uh, if you're running for the iris code, iris code runs, and that's what you're checking and helping a couple of people to run to get the data imported in. So yeah, if uh, Mark and Sagan, if you guys can also be on the chat room, please. Yeah, I mean, the comment chat. Yeah, I think in some cases, the, the comments uh, may have been added 
for this specifically may not be in the original code. So the green stuff may not be in all the code, um, but all the other ones are supposed to be there. Um, well, like, for example, the uh, get split function, I couldn't find that. Um, and it doesn't quite follow as to what um, was showing in, in the PowerPoint. Yeah. So that we'll have to double check that one. But it's um, in some cases, the code's been slightly modified. Uh, but there should be, if we look back at the original um, algorithm, uh, there it's supposed to be the test split, get split, terminal node, and split in Genie index. So those are the, I think there's five functions that should be there. So if something's been changed, it, it shouldn't have been, but um, this is the way that the code was written and should have been the way that you guys got it in your um, files. Now, it might be that, that some renaming has happened, uh, which I didn't know about, but in the, the end, there should be still these five functions. Um, so once you've got this program written, you still have to be able to call it um, so that you can take new data and predict with it. Um, and so this is the predict function. And so it's, it allows you to do this uh, analysis and, and to make um, your splittings and decisions with the new data set. So the, the entire program, and if it's different from what you guys got, um, was supposed to be 123 lines. Um, there's 30 comment lines and 91 coding lines. And because it's a small data set, uh, it should work very quickly. So it should only take about a second to train. And then to test on the test data set, the um, 45 samples, um, should only have another second of the whole thing. So with this three set of, of, of um, species, we actually have a confusion matrix, which is a three by three rather than a two by two. So Satosa, Virginica, and Versicolor. And we want to figure out um, what percentage, uh, and this is, should be 100%, 0%, or the number that were there. So if you run the program, and it was trained on this training set of 100 and five. Um, the performance was perfect. Um, so from the training, it, it learned. Now the question is, has, has it overtrained? So this is where we have to test our model with the holdout data set. And the holdout set is these 45. And so when we run the 45 on that, on that program, um, we find out that we get um, almost a perfect set, but it, it kind of gets confused between Virginica and Versicolor. And what should have happened if it was perfect, we get you know one, one, one along the diagonal and zero everywhere else. But we can see that the Versicolor and Virginica um, are confused. And we have this, um, some Virginica being classified as Versicolor. So ideally, and this is something that people need to be aware of, you want to have your training you know, as good as you can get. In this case, it's perfect. But even if it wasn't perfect, you know, supposedly it, it's better than what you could do manually or what uh, other people have reported. And then you want to say, have I overtrained? Um, and if it's overtrained, uh, sometimes a little hard to tell. I mean, you could have also got a result with your testing say, data set where it also looks identical to your training. Um, that's a good sign. Uh, it says it's robust. If your performance on your testing data set is maybe 5 or 6% lower overall, and so in this case, we're going to calculate the average of 100, 193, so divided by 3, the average performance is like 96% or 
So this is within that five or six percent range. If I had done it on the test and I got on the diagonal 0 0.35, 0 0.32, 0 0.46, um, you know, that's probably an average of 35 or 40 percent. That's terrible. That would tell me that my I've overtrained, that I've um, somehow either decided or used features or hadn't you know, had enough training data, hadn't um, maybe my testing data is so different than the training that that's why it's doing so terrible. Those are things you have to evaluate. But in this case, um, the training and testing performance is within that five or 6% threshold. And so we can be confident that it hasn't been overtrained. So if we've evaluated and, and you know, we've created the program, we've got our data set, we've chosen a model, we've written a program, evidently there's some discrepancy between the program that's on the slides and what you guys get. And I hope that Sagan and Mark and Vasu can kind of sort that one out because the code wasn't supposed to change uh, from the slide. Um, and then you can test and validate the model. And then once you've done that and we've done that, uh, we can use this to make predictions. So we've basically got a decision tree program um, that's in Python and it predicts iris flower classes. We tested on a training set of 105 flowers. Um, so we trained it and then we tested on a holdout of 45. And it's quite generic. Um, it uses the general genie index. It uses you know, general numbers. It has, um, so we can actually use it for the classification of um, patients, cases and controls with uh, maybe different levels of gene um, expression, protein expression, or metabolite levels, or SNPs. And, and so in this case, um, we're going to sort of dive a little bit into um, using the code. Now, I've shown the stuff in Python. Uh, we've written this in R, and so if people are more comfortable with R and understanding R, they can use that.